Okay, hi, shalom everybody. Um, I'm Riva Muna, and we're learning here in Svat, Ira Kodesh. It is Yud Zayin Kislev, Hatafshin Pei Aleph, the 17th of the month of Kislev. I believe it's December 4th, but I could be wrong. <laughs> Third, see? See, I was wrong. Um, 2020. Um, so we are sharing Torah today on uh, Parashat Vayishlach. And um, the name of the class um, is um, uh, hmm. <laughs> Healing um, Sacred Sexuality and the Secret of Holy Aloneness. And uh, this class, uh, the learning for this class is um, for the elevation of the neshama of Tova's mother. It's today is her yurt site. So for Nechama Bat Moshe Zalman, may her neshama have uh, a great aliyah, may she have great nachat ruach from um, all the light from herself and her children and grandchildren and great grandchildren, great grandchildren, Adead, um, and uh, for Rafua Shalema, for Menachem David ben Rivka, and Tinok ben Chava, and for the Aliyah Neshama of Shmuel Lazer ben Michael. And uh, may this Torah learning be for the elevation of my Rebbe, Reb Shlomo ben Naftali, the Pesia, and my Rav, Halav uh, Lazar Mordechai ben Gedaliahu Aharon, and Avi Mori, Ephraim ben Merliahu. Um, okay, so um, I just want to set a little kavana, um, two things. One is that um, these are very, very sensitive topics, obviously. Um, the topic of sexuality and the topic of sexual wounding. Um, and to me, um, the gift and beautiful chesed of Hashem is that the Torah code is the blueprint of all of creation, so all of experience is found within her, and therefore the remedies are also found within her. So it's important for me to remember that and to share that as we take the dive into um, talking about the wounding, that um, it says that Hashem always creates and gives the refuah before the makkah, so that the refuah for something, the healing and the full healing, the full revealed healing of something is already created and in place even before the wounding happens. And that, believe it or not, the wounding is actually part of getting to the revelation of the fullness of the integration and the full healing. So it's very important to keep that in mind um, as we dive in. And uh, the other thing is that uh, I literally have been eating, breathing, sleeping, not so much sleeping, <laughs> mamash not sleeping, these Torahs this whole last week um, because they're so important and they're so um, deep and they're so uh, the core of so much of, um, of what is being called up to be healed right now in ourselves and uh, and between ourselves and in the world. So um, having said that, there is so much that I, it's actually could be at least three different classes. And because I didn't have that opportunity, I might, we'll see what happens on Shabbos, um, it might be more of an overview of many things without getting to the enough detail. It will be whatever it will be. And I am offering that to Hashem um, as always, um, but more especially today. Um, I truly ask Hashem that none of my words be um, harming or wounding to anybody. And if they are only in a place that is um, allowing Hashem to let the light in of healing, um, any pagamim in my own vessel and in my own light and my own ability to receive and give it over, may they be completely set aside so that um, the me Hashem's message comes through me. Um, as light and as um, healing and as hope and as um, deep amuna. Okay, so here we go. <laughs> okay, 
Um, so there's so much in this Parsha. There's so much. Um, but I'd like to begin, um, first of all, just with all of us taking just, just a breath or two and coming into the space and receiving that when we come together, um, it's, um, it's to receive Hashem's wisdom. And when we come together, we look at and we notice all the hashgacha pratit of the moment. So we notice, first of all, that with all the struggle happening in this week's Parsha, it's also going to be Yud Tes Kislev this Shabbos. Mm -hmm. So there's a, Yud Tes Kislev is, is a whole other class, which we will have, please God. But just to say that it is the birthday of Hasidus or Kabbalah, the Kabbalistic and the inner um, teachings and light and wisdom. Um, and it is um, the day that the Admor has a ken, um, the Alter Rebbe, also known as Rabbi Shnei Orzalman, Miliadi, who's also called the Balatanya. He has many names. Balatanya is from the famous um, book that he wrote called the Tanya. And um, it is the day that he was let out of jail uh, on this plane of existence. Um, he was accused just for being a Jew of uh, incitement against uh, the Russian government. But whatever, uh, one of the key teachings of Hasidut is that anything that happens in this physical world is actually a mirror of things that are happening on higher worlds. And by worlds, to be clear, they're not physical places, of course, but we're talking about states of consciousness and states um, and the unfolding of creation, right? Because we have, um, for example, to visualize something as one state of creative process, and then to actually birth something is the final state of a creative process. So. Um, on that day when he was um, set free, it is also um, the birthday and the Yortzeit, in other words, the day of the passing of the Magid Mimezerich, um, also just lovingly called the Magid. Um, a, a great, a great, 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 um, uh, brilliant and, and compassionate spiritual master. And this began um, this journey, which is to, um, unblock all of the fountains and all of the springs of the deepest, deepest um, healing inner wisdom. So it's, um, we call it Hasidut, which is uh, really Hasidut is again to take the teachings of Kabbalah and teach them in such a way that become accessible to everybody and anybody so that you don't have to first be um, a complete master of all of the 24 books of Torah in order to receive this wisdom and begin applying it to your life and sharing it with others, which is really the, probably one of the most important things about Hasidut, um, that you know, when, if you know Aleph, teach Aleph. If you receive uh, some wisdom from Hashem, to uh, let it, first let it completely fill you and permeate you. Sometimes we, um, we jump the gun and we give it over before we've completely let it fill us. So it's very important to first let it sit and heal whatever it needs to heal within your own being and then allow it to flow out from you forward. Mm -hmm. um, so um, this Shabbos itself uh, is a day absolutely filled with light and revelation. And um, we call it uh, in Chabad Hasidut, we call it the Rosh Hashanah of Hasidut. So it, it's, it's another level of Rosh Hashanah. Um, and, um, and that, that's happening this Shabbos. So it's whenever we, we receive um, a gift of space-time and then our own being, where we're showing up in the space-time, it's to notice the fullness of what is being offered in this moment. So this Shabbos, we're being offered this Parsha and Yudtes Kislev together, and then whoever we're gonna be at the table with, right, mm -hmm. as wisdom gifts. So just to be aware of that, and then again, right now, where, if, you're, if you're watching at home or if we're here in the class, um, what is happening inside of me right now 
And who am I sitting next to? Who am I sitting across from? And this awareness that I'm being gifted right now, deep gifts of healing. And um, everybody who's been called here and has joined here together, it's part of the wisdom gift offering. So the more we open to the awareness of that, the more deeply we're able to, to notice and to receive. Okay. So... Um, we're going to cover, please, God, in this class. Um, um, what happened to Dina, Leah and Yaakov's daughter? And um, what was the background that maybe even allowed it to happen, to unfold this way? Um, and we're going to discuss something called holy aloneness also, and the connection between the two. That's, that's what we're, what we're going to do today. So um, we will begin by um, talking about, um, it says that um, Dina's daughter, Leia, uh, sorry, Dina's daughter um, goes out, right? It's, again, it calls her this name, a Yatsanit, one who goes forth, one who goes out. So right off the bat, we're learning something about uh, sexual wounding and sexual abuse. What the Torah is teaching us, right? Number one is that if the mother has been wounded in this way, it's likely that that's going to be passed to the daughter mm -hmm. um, because it's part of the healing. And, um, and number two, we see that she's called Leah's daughter, right? Which is to say also that um, there is something in her as well that is also um, hungry for connection that she's not finding uh, seemingly from her father. And we know, again, this is a very common pattern of girls who grow up without fathers, or the father is disconnected or absent in some way. There is a hunger for uh, acceptance from a man. There is a hunger for um, love and affection. And um, it, it does go back also to um, fixing but first, we can't fix anything until we begin by noticing what, what happened. So we're going to take a step back and recall that um, one of the outcomes of the breakdown of the relationship between Adam and Chava is that it says that from then on, women will have a challenge to fix within them, otherwise called a klala, but I do not resonate with that word whatsoever. But it says, Utishukatech um, elav, your desire will be for him, vehuyim sholbach, and he will rule over you. So there is something before women reaching their full Mashiach revelation of consciousness that's something that we have to work through for a long time sometimes um, is this belief and this desire that it will come from outside of ourselves, and particularly through, that it will come through a man. So um, we're going to see that it, this is the Torah. Is, uh, honestly, I literally haven't slept almost at all for the last two nights um, because I'm I'm just um, astonished at the depth and the beauty of our Torah that is, is weaving all of these beautiful um, remedies together. Um, so the Torah makes this very, very um, profound connection between um, a state of loneliness, which keeps coming up again and again in this week's Parsha, um, and everything that is happening in this week's Parsha. What happens to Yaakov, which is essentially he's wounded in his left thigh, the Gid Hanesha, which we'll uncover soon, that is deeply connected 
to sexual wounding. That is exactly where he was wounded. And, it, and all the halachot that we have around not eating the Gid Hanesha have to do with that and our role in the world as Jews, specifically around sacred sexuality, which we'll talk about. And um, if we take the words, vatetse dina bat lea, right? Vatetse starts with a vav. Vatetse dina dalid, bat abet, and a lamed. Right. So if you write that down, you have a vav, dalid, bet, and lamed, and it's the word levado backwards, which is exactly what it says about Yaakov. Right? Vayvateo Yaakov levado. He was left alone. It's the same word, levado. And then we go back to whenever, remember that whenever we want to know the core energy of a word or a concept in Torah, we go back to the first time we ever received that word. And the first time we ever received the word levado, of course, is from Bereshit when it says, Lo tov eyot adam levado. It is not good for an Adam to be in this state called levado. And we're already seeing that there is something about that levadoness and sacred sexuality because he has not yet found his true mate, right? Remember, that, remember the, the, the Midrash that he actually has relations with all the animals as he's searching for his mate. And whether that's literal or not literal, it's really not a relevance to us because what we're trying to understand is that he mated with different aspects of consciousness that were not a full resonance with the totality of his full body spirit resonance, what he was capable of, and therefore a deep, deep sense of loneliness because um, Everything seeks resonance. Even if we pluck a string on an instrument, the strings that share the same vibratory um, spectrum will, will reply <laughs> in resonance to that string because we seek resonance. We seek to be in unity. The same way you know, we have um, gravity or we, you know, magnetism, things are seeking hashlama shlemut, a sense of wholeness, a sense of fullness. So we, we're just right now, you know how much I love maps. <laughs> we're doing the maps, and hopefully we'll have time to unpack all the maps. So, um, so we're already seeing, oh, wow, there's something so deep in this Parsha, in, in Vatetse Dina Batleya, Tetse, her going out, and the code that's hidden in there. She's going out from a place of loneliness, and perhaps from seeing the relationship between her parents. Obviously, if her mother was treated as a snu'a, what are the energetic imprints that she received of what it is to be a woman and what it is to be wanted, right? She, remember, she's not Rachel's daughter. It says, Vatetse Dina Bat Leia. Why do we need to know that she's Bat Leia? because she's continuing Leia's tikkun, right? And she's continuing, obviously, that feeling of Leia. That's something, right? And also, but Tetse Dina bat Leia, because also Leia went out looking for connection. So she's also looking for some form of connection. Okay. Um, and... Um, So this is going, this story is going to become a blueprint. So any woman who experiences sexual abuse can look in the Torah and find, first of all, resonance that she is not alone and also find the healing remedy inside. So please, God, that's the intention for today. Um, okay, so 
what I what I just want to say is um, to give a tiny bit of a background of um, sorry of why um, why these things happen. Okay, so it's very important to keep in mind always. Um, it's not that it's do all because it's not. But al tagidu maim maim. It's very important that we don't separate it. But there's stories that happen in our lives and in this plane of consciousness, and that's what we call our perspective. And then there's sto- the same story happens, and we can explain it and examine it and explore it from what we call Hashem's perspective, right? And it's very important. And they're both they're both very um, relevant, and they're really only they're really one thing. But we have to be very sensitive when we're learning about it because. To, to talk about someone who went through sexual abuse and say, oh, it's all part of God's plan, that can be, get, can be very wounding, even though it is true that it was all part of God's plan. So we begin by saying, from the human perspective, okay? So from the human perspective, um, it's important, first of all, um, oh, I, I'm sorry, I also wanted to add in the Ilui Nishmas, um, Ron Levi Yitzchak, it's on my note, I'm sorry. Okay, so it's very important um, to understand that there's the humanness of it, and um, we're in no way discounting the, the depth of the pain and the wounding. And um, I wanted to add, say that because I saw a very, very beautiful piece from the Rebbe, from the Lubavitcher Rebbe, and it, it actually literally brought me to tears, this piece because the Rebbe says that um, there are some experiences in life that um, are so traumatic that they actually do reach the depth of the soul, which we call atzmut, right? Which was etzem, or the very inside inside of a person, because usually we say that the soul doesn't get wounded, right? The psyche might get wounded, um, the mind got, might get wounded, but um, we have different states of consciousness in Kabbalah. And, and way above Keter, we have something called Atzmut, which is really the inside, inside, inside essence. And the Rebbe, in the most beautiful, compassionate way, um, said that yet this kind of sexual wounding actually goes all the way to the Etzem, to the Atzmut. And so we have to be so conscious and so sensitive when talking about it and, and even more so when healing um, these places. So from that perspective, um, it's just to hold that we're in no way saying that it's okay that it happened because it was part of God's plan. We're, we're in sorrow and grief that it happened. And we're also going to shed light that there's light hidden even within these stories that can wound somebody to their very, very etzem, to their very, very depths. So um, for those of you who don't know the story, it's important to give a two-second overview. So Dina, who is Leah and Yaakov's daughter, um, she goes out um, and then there's all kind of midrashim of why she went out, but she goes out and she meets Shrem, who is a, a non-Jewish prince, who is the son of Hamor. Again, it's very important always to look at people's names, which we will in a minute, because their name is essentially their essence and what's happening to them at that moment in time. Um, and, uh, and Shrem rapes her. And, and then we find this very, very strange Lashon that he rapes her and he forces her and he uses this word. And then right after that, it says Ve'ye'ehav, that he loved her. It's very, very strange Lashon, right? He, he forcefully rapes her and then it says he loves her. And he loves her so much. And it actually says, and this is shot, this is not a Midrash, it says that his soul was cleaving to the soul of Dina. That that's how much he loves her. So, I mean, obviously these are very sensitive ideas and we're, we're, we're going to unpack them uh, in a sensitive way. 
Um, so we'll just begin by taking a step back and, and starting with her name. So her name is Dina, which means din, which means constriction of the light, judgment. Okay, if you switch around the letters of her name, you get hadin, right, or the judgment, the state of the const absolute constriction and hiddenness of light. And you also get the word nida, nun yudalad he, right? Now, we know what nida is, is when um, a woman is, uh, has her period, and the um, seven clean days after that. And what, what it means is that it's a time when we're bleeding, is a time that if we have sexual relations, we, we won't cons typically, I mean, it's not that there's never exceptions, but typically um, it's not a time that we are able to conceive because it's a time of uh, release of potential life, right? The egg is being flushed out through the womb, through the cervix. Um, and so the energies are at odds, right? It's a time of death. It's not a time of conception, a time of renewal, right? It's a time of release and death. The reason we don't want to have sexual relations at that time is, again, because we don't want to mix energy of love and life force and connection with the energy of separation and loss and grief. Because again, the egg has not been fertilized. It's not going to become a child, a baby. And it is a time of letting go of that potential, um, right? So we don't mix, so we're very sensitive in Torah that we don't mix um, life and death. When I, we, we make protective um, spaces for life and life force. And when death happens, we make a separate space for death, um, you know, so that one is not infecting the other. Um, I hope that is, that's clear, okay? So her very name is Nida, right? Dina, Nida, right? Which is, um, um, a very heavy energy to uplift, obviously. Okay, so um, the Arizal comes along and says, sorry, before I go there, so sorry, I'll just stick with her name for a moment, Dina. Okay, now to give one tiny bit of a background, um, Leah was pregnant before Dina was born. Leah was pregnant, and she saw in a prophetic vision in Ruach HaKodesh that she was going to have another boy, and this boy would have been Yosef. But out of great compassion for her sister, Rachel, who would then have even less boys born to her than the maidservants, she prays to God that she does not have a boy and that this baby inside the womb will be changed into a girl. So that, and again, coming from great love and compassion for her sister. So keep that in mind that Dina is also woven into her very being these energies of great compassion and lack of competition between women. It's very important because this is all parts of the threads of what causes sexual abuse and what the healing is right? So in her very being, she's also holding this great light of a sister who sets aside her own personal need for love and kavod and attention and sets that aside and transcends it out of compassion for Rachel that she shouldn't feel less so that there is not this competitive um, di dynamic happening between women. That also goes into who Dina is, and we'll see later how she, how her journey unfolds. Okay. So inside the womb, instead of Leah now being pregnant with Yosef, she's now pregnant with Dina. Instead of it being a boy, she's pregnant with a girl. So that's really important to know that Dina's undergoing a whole story before she even gets out of the womb. Okay. 
So, um, and then, you know, what we talked about, about um, Um, I'm saying this uh, again because um, I won't exclude myself because of my own stories and because of stories of so many people who come to speak with me. Um, the Torah is, is, is inviting us into the dialogue of why do these type of stories happen to certain types of people, right? And so we're already noticing um, that, oh, she's already coming in with a certain sense of judgment on her, Dina, right? Um, of um, of um, maybe not being sure what her place is, right? She was a boy, now she's a girl. She's like, what is exactly her place, right? And um, again, it says that she's Leah's daughter. So she hasn't seen her mother treasured. She hasn't seen her mother looked at as beautiful. She hasn't experienced her. In fact, again, like after Rachel dies, Yaakov moves his bed into Bilhah's tent, right? Which was very wounding to Ruvain, who is Dina's big brother. So everyone in the family is, is being affected, right? As we know that this is true, because as great as these souls are and were, they're also human, and we're, they're also living through family dynamics, right? So what did that feel like to be Ruvain and see his mother treated that way? And then how does that affect the girl in this story, the Dina in the story, right? And we know it's affected her because she's going out looking for something, right? Um, and, um, and then she gets raped. So it's... Please, again, these, please, nobody, please take my words out of context, please. But um, there is a dynamic that when a girl is hungry for masculine attention and masculine um, validation and love and to be understood in a certain way and to be held in a certain way and to see that also between her parents, and then how does that affect her? We're just making a space for that. And everybody's nodding. You guys can't see on the mm -hmm. camera, but everyone's nodding because, because it's, it's so relatable. Um, and um, what was it like for Leia to continue to have physical relations with a man and bear children to a man who may have been a very great spiritual master, and yet she is experiencing herself as being hated, right? And now, how does that affect her child, even in the womb? Again, I am a mother myself, and I am far from a perfect human being, wife, mother, daughter, lover, any of it. So this isn't to call up blame in anybody. It's to call up attention to our wounds and our woundedness um, and, and calling it up to get healed and to notice. And that's what it's doing. This is at this first stage. Um, okay, so, so now we're going to talk about it from um, Hashem's perspective, so to speak, right? In other words, as terrible as these things are, once they have happened, we accept that they have happened um, from great love from Hashem, that everything that Hashem does is from love. So we do whatever we can to protect our children, to protect people, that these stories should never happen, of course. But now that they have happened, how do we go about bringing light into these stories? So we go back to Dina and this very strange pasuk about Shrem loving her and cleaving to her soul. So Dina, according to the Ariya Kadosh, um, 
and Shrem are the Gilgal of um, Avraham Avinu's parents. Amat, um, I can never pronounce her name. Amat Laye and Terach. Dina is Amat Laye, Avraham's mother, and Terach is Avraham's father. And uh, the Arizal says that Terach uh, raped Amat Laye, and that's how Avraham Avinu was conceived. And then the Zohar goes on. I'm so sorry. I know these are very heavy, but we're going to get to the light. We're going to get there. We're going to get to the light. And um, it says that he uh, raped her while she was in Nida. So now that grandchild is going to continue the refining process of the soul. So I'm, I'm asking all of us for a second. There's the horror and the trauma, and then there's a very big perspective and plan of the refining of energy and the refining and the revelation and the move out from darkness into light. So we're, we're going to please God with Hashem's help hold both of those spaces together now. Um, so, so the Ari uh, continues and says, this same neshama that is in Dina, she goes through three more cycles of beginning with a man who is harming her and ending up with a man who is on the highest spiritual vibration and level. And we'll, we'll say the three, okay? She begins by being raped by Shrem and she ends up marrying her older brother, Shimon. Right? Shimon married her. Again, um, for people who are watching at home, um, and to some extent, the Avot did follow the Torah, but obviously not these halachot. It is actually a sur in the Torah for brother and sister to get married, but because this took place before Mount Sinai and before the actual revelation of the Aserot uh, um, Adibot, on some level this was allowed, and Shimon ends up marrying Dina. Okay. In the next Gilgul, or the next reincarnation, this same soul comes back again as Avigail. And she is married to Naval, which you can hear the word Nevela. He's disgusting. He's a crude, crude, boorish man. And for some reason, she again passes through having to begin in darkness in terms of her connection with a man and go through another transformation process and she ends up marrying David HaMelech. That's pretty good. That's her second time. The third time that she does this, she comes back as the Roman Empress, the wife of Timinus Rufus. She's married again to a very crass, very boorish, very violent man. Um, her, she, I don't, we don't know her name, but she's the wife of Timus, Timius Rufus, who was um, a uh, Roman who was, he was part, uh, Hadrian was his um, hemshech, his <laughs> continuer. <laughs> Hello, do you speak English at all? <laughs> her, um, um, but this is an incredible story in the Gemara. Um, she again passes from being a non-Jew, the non-Jewish wife of Timaeus Rufus. She converts and she ends up marrying Rabbi Akiva. So just to add into the mix that the Ishbitzer says that Rabbi Akiva and his wife were the fixing of Zimri and, Co and Cosby, who were the fixing of Shrem and Dina. Okay, there's a reason why Chazal takes so much time to explain all of this, like who was who and what was happening, right? And what they're saying is this, the reason that Shrem loved her so much is that 
there was something in his neshama that had fallen into so much darkness. And by being with Dina, I know this is going to be so hard for people, so please just let's all be so sensitive around this, but Dina actually volunteered. And I'm talking about on a soul level. I'm not saying any woman volunteers for sexual abuse or to be raped. So to be raped. So please, we have to keep the, the two worlds separate and simultaneous, right? But on a soul level, we're talking about, in other words, when we're seeing things from a bird's eye perspective of all of humanity and all of the fixing and all of the reuniting and rebalancing of all of humanity, there are some souls that are like, okay, I'll, I'll do that. I'll take that mission. So what happened when he raped her, and it says by Yehav that he loved her, he did in fact love her because the highest parts of his being were able to find resonance and find a home in Dina. Again, I am only too aware how sensitive these Torahs are. But I say this because essentially what happened is that it's going to redeem Dina's soul and redeem her story to understand that it's her very willingness to allow herself almost to become pregnant with the light part of Shem and save that part, save his humanity, and actually give him another chance to be woven back in to the fabric of all of creation because there are some um, actions that we do that are so um, horrific that they damage a soul to such a deep, um, I'm not ta even talking about from the victim side right now, I'm talking about from the perpetrator side, that the perpetrator suffers so much because they have inflicted um, such darkness. And um, and such wounding um, that there are these souls that actually out of tremendous compassion, and again, please understand what I'm saying. This is a rule again and again and again in Hasidut. The reason we had a Shabtai Tzvi, the reason we, reason we had a Yaakov Frank, is because people took these concepts of picking up fallen sparks and thought, oh, well then let's lechat chila, in other words, let's, um, let's a priori, right, before that's happened, let's choose to go to these dark places and do these stories and uplift the sparks. And of course, that is not the path of Torah. We, we don't choose um, trauma and suffering and, and victim perpetrator consciousness. We're, we're saying the opposite. We're saying if it already happens and for whatever reason, um, there are some people who are primed from a young age to be susceptible to that, but to also hold love and gratitude and, and um, forgiveness, I'm going to say, even for God, right? That ultimately, it's even that is coming from very high hidden lights um, and low lights, right? We're going to, because we're, let's not forget this is, this week we're learning this in the week of Yudtes Kislev, and we're learning it also as next week we're going into Hanukkah, which is when, right, we're really going to redeem these stories. Okay, so, so, so far we've seen something about this redemption that happens to Shrem. And now I'll add you another piece. So then the Zohar comes and says, this spark of Shrem that went into Dina, so Dina like held his light for him. So, right? And so, that, so his, what was all the parts about him that were in alignment with goodness and, um, with wholeness and with kindness and with compassion and with love of himself and God and others, she actually held that part, which is why he loved her. And from there, say Chazal, 
that spark goes through its little journey and it comes into and becomes Chanina ben Turadion, who was a great Tana and who was one of the Asara Harugim. He was one of the ten martyrs killed with Rabbi Akiva um, and who we speak about on Yom Kippur. Who were they? Does anyone know who they were? Yes. They were the ten brothers who sold Yosef. So what we're really seeing here is that what looks like, I can barely get this out of my mouth, the worst thing that ever happened to us, the darkest story that broke us, if we could see it, from a generational perspective, from a bird's eye view, that we know nothing, and we don't know who is breaking who, and who is holding whose light, and who is redeeming whose light, and who is paying back for someone holding their light. Um, and if perhaps if we knew from that grand perspective, right, it would begin to be part of the healing process. Right, um, And this was what the Ari would do. He would give people back their soul by, by filling in the gaps in the story. Right? Because if we're, of course when we're only looking at one thread, it's heart-wrenching. But if we understood, because how could a compassionate God... Um, I have to keep in teacher mode here. <laughs> fey, fey. <laughs> um, allow a world where there's rape and rape of children and sexual abuse and molestation, right? Uh, I, I know only too well, personally, and on the claw level, how this can wound somebody's neshama, right? But here, like, thank you to the Arizal and all of the holy masters and to the Rebbe, and the Rebbe's compassionate response of like, we have to hold both. We have to hold that a person does get wounded to their atzmut and that also there is the greatest, greatest light hidden in these stories. Okay, so far so good? Everybody still breathing? <laughs> okay, because we this is just the beginning. Okay, so, um, so now that we're gonna see, oh, so this experience of levado is always going to be threaded through searching for something and some wholeness and, a, and this fixing of this levado energy um, through whole and healed sexuality. Yeah? And by the way, okay, so just continuing for a second, what happens to Dina and Shrem? So Dina and Shrem, Dina conceives. Right, and then Dina ends up marrying Shimon, but Dina has a daughter from her connection by being raped by Shrem, and that daughter is Osnat. Osnat is given to a couple in Mitzrayim, they adopt her, Mr. and Mrs. Potiphar. And Osnat has now, the light has been preserved and is now being, where does God always hide the light? In the dark, right? Mm -hmm. Moshe grows up in Paro's palace. Osnat grows up with Potiphar. Hashem, that's Hashem's little trick. If you ever want to find the greatest light, go to the darkest place because it's a trick. It's a little trick that Hashem does. He's very good at this. Mm -hmm in the darkest, worst places, and then like nobody would look there. <laughs> so a snot is there waiting, and years later, bloop, 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 who comes her uncle to Mitzrayim, Yosef, and becomes her husband, and they become what? The perfected, perfectioners, it's not a word, but it is now, <laughs> um, that he is the master of holy sexuality. Remember, right? He, in no matter what, his, where his loneliness takes him, 
and it could have brought him into victim consciousness. I deserve to be with Patifara's wife. Look what's happened to me. I deserve some comfort. I deserve to be held. That's usually where we fall sexually. It begins, I'm, I'm talking about the sexuality that breaks us, that harms us. It's, it's, it, it begins with this chisawon, with the perception that there's a lack. I didn't get enough love. I didn't get enough holding. I didn't get ten attention. I didn't get mirroring. I didn't get validation. I didn't get something. And I have this huge lack. And I'm going to go out, yotse, and I'm going to find something to fill this lack that I didn't get. Yosef doesn't do that. Well, to be fair, he also didn't have the same lack, right? He grew up with parents who deeply were in love and deeply prayed for him and deeply chose him. So he has a totally different test. But because he was so infused with love, also hashkacha pratij, or divine providence, Hashem puts a different kind of vessel now into the picture. Someone who has so much love and self-esteem and validation and, and so much his dreams are believed in um, that even when he's in victim mode, he doesn't go there because he is energetically imprinted with the feeling of what true love is and true sexuality. In other words, the union of Yaakov and Rachel, that's how he's made. So he's not, um, he doesn't have that hunger. Okay, so far so good? Okay. So now let's talk about what happens to Yaakov that night. Okay, the night. I wanted to tell you what night it was, and I did all this research, and weirdly, I found three different sources that say it's three different nights. Four. One, the Ma'or V'Shemesh says that it was Lagba Omer night um, because it was, um, there's 365 veins and sinews in the body and each one is connected to a different day of the year. And this was the, the day of the Gid Hanesha or the sciatic nerve going down the left um, uh, thigh hip, and hip and leg. Um, so that's the, according to the Ma'or V'Shemesh. And what is the 33rd day? What is Lagba Omer? It's Hod Shebe Hod. Hod is the left leg. So it's the wounding and the healing of Hod, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, and then I saw um, another um, piece that said that it was Tisha B'Av night. And therefore, it was the descent into the absolute bottoming out of darkness. And then I saw another piece that said it was Purim night. So um, I definitely see a theme through the three, but I just wanted to give you guys that over. Tish above. Um, and all three, of course, are basically saying that it is the, the absolute bottom pit and apex, either way, of, of darkness. Like it doesn't get darker than this. So let's see what happens. So he takes... Leah and Rachel and all his oxen, oxen and all his donkeys and all his children. And he crosses them over to the other side of the Yabok River. Just to be clear, Yabok is um, a Yud, a Bet, and a Kuf. Does that ring familiar to anybody? It's Yaakov without the Ain. Right? So he's crossing the Yabok River, but he gets there and he realizes he forgot something on the other side. What did he forget? He forgot his Ayn that makes him Yaakov on the other side. Okay, so we'll keep going. And he also forgot his little jugs, right? His little jugs of oil that he left on the other side. So there's some process this night that he is um, going to go back and reclaim parts of himself that have been left behind, that have been cut off, that were so wounded in whatever this experience was of tricking his father and then running away and then living with Lavan and then going through whatever he's gone through 
with Leah and with Rachel and his children, some part of him has been so deeply wounded in this process that it's been cut off and it's me'evel, it's on the other side of the river. And he has to go back now in this week's Parsha and redeem those parts of himself. Okay, now the really amazing, beautiful thing is that um, it's the same process that his daughter is going through in this story, right? She also, like in other words, light has now been hidden and left behind in, in different places and they're both mother, uh, sorry, father and daughter this week um, doing mirror, mirroring work, right, of parts of themselves being um, um, disintegrated, right, and being disconnected, but the weaving starts this week for both of them to reclaim these parts of themselves. Now, a really amazing thing is that, um, so yabok is yud um, betkuf, right, without the ayin. So ayin is 70, right? In other words, he has to go back to become Yaakov again. He has to cross over the yabok and get his ayin and come back so he can be Yaakov. Then he's going to keep transforming um, into Yisrael, right? But so the ayin is, um, is 70, the gematria, or the numeric value of 70. So weirdly enough, 70 is the gematria of yain, or wine, right? It's a nun and two yuds, 50, 60, 70, wine. Well, where is wine made? Wine is made in a yekev, right? In a vineyard. Oh, same letters. Yud, kuf, bet. Okay, why does that matter? other than it being like a cool piece of Torah, because cool Torah is great, but what we want is to integrate healing remedies into our being, into our community, into our psyche. Um, so um, one of the interpretations of the Eitz Hadat, in other words, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, one of the interpretations is that it was wine. It was grapes, which, was, which were made into wine. Um, which, was, would be, which was the Pagam Hadat. The Pagam Hadat is the wounding, the initial wounding of um, connection, and it's specifically sexual connection, because it says, Adam Yada Trava Ishto. It's sexual knowing in a way that is not, um, um, not divisive, does not cut people into pieces. Right? So in other words, it's not the split between body and soul or, um, or uh, being together out of a state of lack, right? It's being together out of a state of fullness and sharing and a full female and a full male and a full um, desire to both give and receive to and from one another, right? So um, he goes back over this river, and again it says he's left there, Vayvatel Yaakov Levado, right? So again, there's something about facing this very, very deep existential loneliness um, that is part, it seems to me, and this is, my chidush, but it seems to me it's part of um, the journey to sacred sexuality is having to first face this very deep existential loneliness um, and, and, and wrestle with it, really wrestle with it. Again, why, how, how do we know this? Okay, so the next piece, it says that Esav or Ace of Malach. Now again, the Meforshim are all over this. Was it a meditative vision? Did it really happen? Was it Yaakov's own shadow self? Was it was it um, Asav's ministering angel? It, it's all yes, okay. But essentially, it's all the same thing, right? He's struggling and battling with an energy that's in opposition um, to his fullness and the and the reclaiming of his wounds. Um, first of his woundedness as Yaakov before he could even think about becoming Israel, right? Um, 
and the woundedness that happened to him through this whole story. So this Malach reaches out and uh, grabs, like they're facing each other, they're, they're a mirror image, right? So the Malach takes his right hand and grabs his left thigh, left hip, right? Left is hod, again, right? Which we're left again, ha ha, ha. Okay, with hod. Now, um, to be clear, Yaakov never recovered from this wound fully. He limped for the rest of his life. Just to be clear, okay? So let's talk a little bit about the Gid Hanesha specifically and about Hod, okay? So the Gid Hanesha is um, a nerve that goes from the bottom of the spine and it goes through um, the thigh and through the hip. Like there's a ball and socket and it, it kind of threads through there and then it goes into the leg. It is the nerve that allows us to stand erect. So when that's wounded, it, it makes the leg unable to, to be fully... Um, Blocked. Yeah. Okay. So we have um, a deep halacha that we don't eat the gidhanesha, right? We don't eat the sciatic nerve, those um, people who eat meat. When the animal is shechted, so we as Jews, we do not eat this sciatic nerve. It has to be taken out along with the fat that's around it. And, um, and the Zohar says that this Gidhanesha, that the thigh is the root and the seat of sexuality in the body. And then I saw this beautiful piece from Rav Cook. So he says that Nesha means forgetting or disjointed. So it's to forget who you are. Anybody who has either willingly or been forced into um, sexual connection, there's a kind of sexual connection that adds to forgetting who you are. And there's a type of sexual healing that is about wholeness and reminding you of who you really are. So in this place, he says that Gid Hanesha is the wound to sexuality when we forget. We forget that we're light beings. We forget we're already whole and loved. We forget that sexuality is about um, Yisod. It's about building a foundation of, of, of um, of a flow, of a channel to allow all light in and all shefa in from the right side and the left side, right? The right side being the masculine and the left side being the feminine. And that Yisod is the container and the channel to allow all that light to join together and birth something. So Rav Cook says, we don't eat the Gidanesha. As the beginning, of sensitizing our souls to move away from prey-predator consciousness that we don't subjugate any other creature, not an animal and not a human being. It's not about conquering. It's not about power. And Rav Cook says, yes, some people need to eat meat to sustain, to sustain themselves that's not the same as devouring something or somebody. Okay, <laughs> are we are way over time? I don't know where we are in time, but I'm not gonna leave it here in the middle. But, um, um, so that, just to say that this Gid Hanesha, um, it's about um, being out of alignment, right? Okay, so um, maybe we'll just say, say a couple of points because I don't know where we are with time. Um, 15 minutes. minutes, perfect. Okay, so um, essentially what happens here is that um, the ayin is also for the shivim amot. It's for the 70 nations, right? The ayin that 
got left on the other side. It's also the ayin for the 70 nations, the 70 languages, right? Um, that again, there's not, we are meant to be in, of service, but of, in deep connection and connectivity. Um, so he grabs him here in Hod, in the place of Hod. And we'll talk in a minute what Hod is, but we'll first begin by saying that our mission statement as Jews and understand that this is the night that Jews are born because we're called B'nai Israel. We're not called B'nai Avraham. We're sometimes referred to as Beis Yaakov, but that usually refers to the woman, but we're called B'nai Israel, living in Eretz Israel. So the very essence of our mission is given over in this struggle because that's when he gets the name Yisrael. What is it to be Yisrael? Who is it to be Yisrael, right? So we look at our mission in the world and we start by saying, we are given halachot or um, a path and guidelines around sexuality more and different than any other nation in the world. And our path is not the path of celibacy. That's not our path, although it may be a perfectly beautiful and good path for a different type of a soul. And it's certainly not the path of um, just connecting with anybody, anywhere, in any time, in any space. So our path, we, and we, something that we must understand and wake up to as Jews is that a great part, if not most of our mission, is about modeling to the world a path of sacred sexuality. And why do I say this? How do I know this? Because we are always working within the structure of Ashan, Olam Sham, Shana Nefesh, right? Space, right? Olam, Shana, time, Nefesh, our vessel, our body moving through space time. So we are given such levels of sensitivity on our path that we, uh, we can come together in only in certain spaces. Right? In other words, it has to be a holy space. We're, we're concerned with what's happening in the room. What is the lighting? What is, um, are there Sifre Kodesh? Are there Torahs? Are the opposite? Are there bad smells there? Is there a bad energy there? Right? Because we're understanding that the power of sacred sexuality is so unbelievably holy whole from the sense of holy also with w wholeness to restore wholeness and healing that we're we are told you, you as jews first of all must be sensitive to the space where this is happening then we're told we need to be sensitive to the times right in other words what's happening in the woman's body is she menstruating? Has she counted? Has she gone to a mikvah? Where, where is her heart at? Where are her hormones at? Where is her mind at? What can come um, out of this union? Because we always want it to be the fullest and the deepest and the most open resonance. Because we've all had experiences, I'm sure, of partnering with somebody when there's not full resonance and the sense of levado, that it actually um, calls up deeper senses of loneliness to be in sexual connection with someone who's not present with you or you're not present. That's a deeper level of levado than even actually just being alone. And we all know that. And again, for those of you who are at home, yes, people are nodding here in the room because yes, because we're in resonance with what that feels like. So 
we as Jews are given um, a task to, to be extra refined and aware of these energies, extra sensitive. But it, right, and, and again, it's not about checking off a box, like, okay, did my wife go to the mikvah? Beach, V. That's a practice to build the internal sensitivity of how wonderfully awesome this mitzvah and this um, gift is. So we're given, so that's in the area of time, right? So we're told, not when she's in Nida, um, not before mikvah, not, and all, we, all these things, not if they're fighting. How many people are together when they're fighting? And our Torah comes and says, no, we don't use that as a way to punish each other. We don't use sexuality as a power play, right? Because what we're trying to do is to bring everything back into harmony and alignment of the Gan Eden way of being where nothing was preying on anything else. It was not victim perpetrator. It was not prey predator energy. And the whole journey back to Gan Eden is that. That's why we talk about the wolf lying down with the lamb. The wolf in Torah is a symbol of sexual predatory behavior. We can go on and on about that, but that is the symbol of the wolf. It's a symbol of Binyamin. I'm not going to go into detail, but for those of you who know, the story of Pilegish Begiva, right? And what happened in Shevet Binyamin and their fixing of what happened there. And um, so, so now we're going to come to somewhat of a place of absolutely not wrapping this up because we haven't even touched the holy aloneness part. We haven't even touched it, but I am trusting that Hashem is going to bring through what needs to come through, what's able to come through in this space. Um, but um, understand that if this is our mission, right, then the only way to wound Am Yisrael is dafka in that area, right? I'll give an example, right? So Bilam, who also limps, yeah, he comes to um, curse Am Yisrael, right? And he tries this, and he tries that, and he's not able to infiltrate his negative intention and energy into the protective shield of Yudke Vavke around Am Yisrael. And why not? Because he even says the words, Matovu Olecha Yaakov, how good are your tents, right? By the way, just a little clue, tent, Ohel, and Leah, just to notice, same letters. Okay, and he says, how godly are your tents? And of course, this beautiful teaching, how the tents, the doors didn't face each other because everybody is holding a place of the sanctity of their intimacy, whether intimacy means sexual or whether it also means their family life, that there's a sanctity, there's an intimacy, there's a privacy, right? And so this creates this protective shield over Am Yisrael. Why? Because it is, in fact, our huge and main mission statement. And when we're in our mission statement, we're in alignment. So the protection and the light and the shield is there, and there's no chink for negativity to come in. So then Bilam has this great idea, and he's like, oh, you know what? I haven't been able to curse them, but I'll tell you what. I know what gets them out of alignment with God. And this, by the way, is what exactly what happens to Yaakov. He rips him out of alignment so that he's limping and schlepping along and he can't stand upright. And of course, the Gid Hanesha threads through and is connected, is right next to the Brit Kadosh, right? Or the reproductive organ in a man. So he comes and he says, if you, you want to get them, have the woman of Moab, have the Moabite woman dress up seductively and go and seduce them. In, and again, we're not concerned about sex. It's not about sex and sexuality. It is about the alignment of the whole tree of life. It's the alignment of 
all of the energies where they get blocked, where they get wounded, where they get stuck, right? Um, and, um, and then therefore that the product, the end product is also gonna be lopsided or wounded or not whole and not able to receive the light and give the light over. So um, that's what they do, right? They go and, and um, they seduce Am Yisrael, right? And, um, and then that begins the downfall. That begins, it, it did make a chink in the armor. And again, it's like, I want to be so clear that when it, it, when it says that this is our mission, it's, it's that we're in no way like prudish or shut down. It's the opposite. It is about such a whole, healed, sensitive sexuality um, that is looking at the entire person and where they are and what they need and what their gifts are and what their wounds are, you know, and taking all of that into account. So much so, like, Chazal spends all this time um, in the Gemara saying, how many times a week should a husband and wife be together? And it goes through, well, is he, does he work in the city, out of the city? Um, is he a Tamid Chacham? Is he a day laborer? Like, all of this consideration um, in order to protect their relationship. Um, so he gets wounded here in this area of Hud um, as, and he doesn't get healed, by the way, yet, right? Yet, yet. Um, but he continues like to struggle with it and to also be um, holding this place of the, um, the rectification also of his daughter. Okay, so it's one more piece, and then I think we'll, we'll try to weave it all back in together. Um, and that's this. We forget that we're one. Why does Yaakov go back? He's a millionaire. Why does he go back for a little jar of oil? And a big part of it is, on, so on a level of Hasidus, it's that he's again going back for these sparks that fell into darkness. That's, that's nice and sweet, right? What does that mean, sparks that fell into darkness? It's part of what it means is when I cut myself off or allowed myself to be cut off, when I had sexual relations that made me forget who I really am, or I could see that the person clearly forgot who they were and who I was, right? Then we do get, have these jars with parts of ourselves that are left on the other side of the river. And this is the week that he goes back and he's like, I cannot go forward until I retrieve the parts of me that got cut off, that got wounded, that got left behind, that I forgot who I really am. I, and understand, it's that same night that he gets the name Israel, right? That now that he's gone back and he's, he's, it, he's admitting and he's looking at what happened to him, what choices he made, where he was the victim, where he was the perpetrator. And the truth is, the healing really only happens when we do both. We go back and we also see in what stories was I the victim and in what stories may I have been the perpetrator. And by perpetrator, we don't mean that we raped somebody. We mean that did we see them in their fullness as a full human being? Or were we looking to get filled on a place of our own loneliness and levado and empty space, right? Were we really seeing this whole person, a whole world in front of us? Has, you know what I'm saying? It's not just black and white, like rape and not rape. It's all the ways where, if from our levado, our fallen levado space, we're looking for something else outside of ourselves, right? Vatitse, dina, vatitse. We're going out and we're trying to find something to, to fill us, right? Well, that's a very different state than after he is battling in his levado place, in the 
thick of night and is also looking at his own actions. Where, how did he end up with Adina? How did this story happen? What was he modeling for Ruvain and Shimon and Levi? Why are they like so protective of women, right? Like who is he in the story? Because he's been part of weaving these energetic patterns. Does that make sense? Um, okay, so it ultimately is, again, it always is, but going back to this fixing of shifting from the Eitz Hadat Tov to the Eitz HaChaim, right? Of, um, of going back and retrieving those places, retrieving those, I mean, again, I, I have to wrap it up, so I have to end, but, but just to put on your maps for those of you who are taking notes, because we haven't even unpacked at all, um, what is Hod? What is the sphere of Hod? Why was it Hod that was wounded? Um, and just the whole, maybe I'll just, I'll give one, I have to give one shout out, one word to this idea of holy aloneness, um, which is to look through uh, for a second all of the imahot and this place of facing the holy aloneness within them before they're able to birth into this level of aware yesod, conscious connection. Sarah is alone in her tent when the Malachim come. Rivka is, chooses to leave her family and be alone and travel to Yitzchak. Um, Leah is alone in her feeling of being the not loved wife. Rachel, um, and in her uh, barrenness, right? And she dies and is buried alone, right? Um, Miriam, as she watched Moshe on the Nilus River, and then she gets tzara'at and she is kicked out of the camp and she has to face holy aloneness. Chana, Penina has all these children, she's alone in her barrenness and she's alone in her tefillah. Esther, alone, locked away from the Jewish people in Ahasuerus' palace, right? Ruth, leaving her entire kingdom, she's a princess, right? And having to leave all of that behind. Join Naomi, finally marry the man of her dreams who's a, an absolute sodic, and he dies that night, right? That's pretty deep level of holy aloneness, right? And many of us hold that she was in her 40s. She has literally waited her whole life to have a soulmate experience. She has it that night, she conceives, and that night Boaz dies. So there is something about, that's just the woman, you know, I, I, I have a whole list of the men. <laughs> but, um, um, you know, but yeah. Um, but it is, um, it is that there is some, um, deep space inside of us of not resisting the depths of the loneliness. And during that time, examining how have I showed up in the area of Yisod? And am I coming like a wolf, like a starving wolf, looking to get fed in that place? Or am I in alignment with my whole being so that it's actually active choice. And not only is it, is it active choice, but um, even when my partner chooses to resonate on a low vibration, um, I have to be very sensitive how I say this. Um, I no longer want to dance in those zones. It's not as a um, not but kifa, right? Not as not as another place of anger or blame or shame, but rather as a place of malchut of like, I love you so much. I choose to be in conscious connection with you because this is literally our geula path as Jews. And again, we know it's our geula path as Jews because we wouldn't have all these extra mitzvahs to increase our sensitivity in this area. It's not where, an, there is no problem of a non-Jew going to 
a pub and picking someone up and being together because that's not their mission. They have a different mission in the world. It's not good or bad or anything. It's just what we were assigned as our mission. And our mission as Kohanim to the world is that we model that it, it's, why is it called Yesod? Because it's the foundation of everything. When we're consciously and lovingly connecting and conceiving from that place and birthing from that place and nurturing each other from that place, that changes everything. All of humanity is changed. Okay, let's bring it into a tefillah. <laughs> um, one piece I will say, um, if anybody who is watching this has been wounded by sexual molesting or rape or any kind of sexual wounding on either side of the victim-perpetrator scale, um, there is light hidden in those stories. And um, I just, I really do want to urge everybody to um, reach out for help and support and, 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 and with, um, with, a, with great courage and compassion that as you do that healing, you're healing your parents and your grandparents and your great-grandparents. Great you're healing all of it backwards up, and you're healing it all forward, too, to your children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren. As we see with Dina, that her daughter Osnat ends up marrying Yosef Hatzadik, who is the pinnacle of holy, sacred sexuality. So may we all um, step into the light path the path of peace, the path of loving our own bodies, our own sexual nature, our own sexuality, seeing it as a gift, um, a delight, our friend, um, um, an absolute treasure. And those places that resist believing that or seeing that, may those places get called up in order to have light shown into them in order to be healed, in order to be reintegrated. Um, and like we end, we'll end with this Shabbos is Yud Tes Kislev. So this whole Parsha is being enveloped and held in extra light and um, in extra revelations from the depths of the light to hold and restore and light our path forward. And may it be now. Amen. Amen.